Today, I decided to play Pokemon Scarlet for 24 hours straight. My goal was to complete the entire storyline and do a few extra things that we'll get into later. But to start at the beginning of the game, we just got admitted to a Pokemon Academy and because of that, the head of the Academy, Director Clavel, brings over three starter Pokemon. Now you already know I went with Sprigatito, since it's both a grass type and a cat, which meant I got to name it after my own cat, Reese's. Then the rest of the beginning is some pretty standard stuff. We meet our rival Nimona, a person who loves battling, the main legendary Coridon, who's also going to be our mount, and Arvin, a person who used to be in charge of Coridon, but now he's giving it to us since he doesn't like them for some reason. Then after those introductions, we make our way to the academy, and on the way, I caught the second long-term addition to my team, Derp the Shrewdle. He was just really cute, so I wanted him. I'm obviously not going to mention every Pokemon I catch in the game, but I will mention the ones I use for a while and how they're progressing as we go. But anyways, we make it to the academy, and I'll be honest, this whole section is kind of boring. You can take classes to learn more about Pokemon and stuff, but going to school also seems like a lot of work, so I mostly skip through it. For something actually important though, we learn about the three main paths you can take for this game. First, there's the regular victory road path that Nimona wants us to do, where you defeat 8 gym leaders, challenge the Elite Four, and become a champion. Then there's the path of legends that Arvin wants us to do, where we defeat Titan Pokemon and get 5 herbs with crazy healing powers. And finally, there's Starfall Street, where we defeat the 5 leaders of Team Star, the game's villain group. This is introduced by someone who hacked our phone named Cassiopeia, but we don't know their actual identity. I decided to start with the Path of Legends since the Titan Pokemon seemed the coolest. And on my way, I got my third long-standing addition to the team, Mr. Krabs. He's adorable. I also evolved my Sprigatito into a Florigato, and honestly, I miss my little buddy, but this is a pretty good evolution. Then after some more random fighting, we find Mr. Krabs' big brother, Cloth. This is our first Titan Pokemon, which are really fun to fight, but always follow the same set formula. First, we beat them just by ourselves. For this, I Terrastalize Reese's 2 and used a grass move to do huge damage. Oh, by the way, Terrastalizing is the gimmick for this game. It basically just ups the power of moves for a Pokemon's Terra type, and Reese's 2's was grass. But I learned about Cloth's ability, Anger Shell. This is when a Pokemon's HP falls to 50% or lower, its attack, special attack, and speed rise one stage each, while its defense and special defense lower by one stage. Unfortunately, it took out Reese's too, so I just finished with my boy Derp. After that, the Titan will always run away once, which gives us a chance to heal. And once we get into the next battle, the Titan eats some of the herbs we want to power itself up, and Arvin joins us with whatever Pokemon he caught recently. Arvin's not a great partner, but he does act as an awesome meat shield, so I can't complain. And that's the first Titan done. We then found the herb, made it into a sandwich, and gave a bit to Crydon, which helped him get some of his powers back. And that means we now finally have the power to sprint. Also, after each Titan fight, the professor in this game, Sada, gives us a call and congratulates us, but we'll learn more about her later. For now, I focused on how there was both a gym and a team star base right by me, so I was like, might as well. Starting with the gym, before we could actually fight, we needed to do a gym challenge, and this one was to find tents and floors that were scattered around the city. I hope they don't pay these assistants well though, because three of them were literally right by me, but I won't complain, I'll take the easy challenge. Then after that, we faced off against Brassius, the grass type gym leader. Thankfully, I had my boy Dirt for this fight, who's a poison type, so Brassius' first two Pokemon weren't a problem at all. Then after Derp finally got taken out by his Terrastalized Pseudo Wudo, I finished out with Reese's 2, and that's our first gym badge done. Now finally after those two things, we can move on to the Team Star base. But literally right before the base, I did find our next teammate, Joey Wheeler the Cyclizer. Joey's a Dragon Normal type, which is an interesting combination, but he's going to be pivotal for our team, so shout out to him. Anyways, once I made it close to Team Star's base, we got interrupted by a new character, Clive, who we've definitely never met before. He helps us? Or at least he says he does, and is basically just another wacky side character for the game. And like everything else, all the team star bases are going to follow the exact same pattern. We start out with a guard at the front, who goes down pretty easily. Then we ring a bell, and they say if we're able to defeat 30 Pokemon within 10 minutes, we get to challenge their boss. For this, we use the game's quick battling feature, and to be honest, I don't know if it's even possible to lose this challenge. Oh, also these bases are like gyms, where they all center around a single type, this one being fire. After we deal with all the goons, we move on to their boss Mela, which how do these students afford these huge cars? And weirdly, these cars aren't just for show. Once we defeat Mela's first Pokemon, we have to fight the car too. 
Thankfully, it's also a fire type somehow, so I was able to use Mr. Krabs and Joey Wheeler to pretty much deal with everything. I should also mention I was very underleveled here, which was a bit weird because at the gym only a bit away, I was the perfect level. After this, we get a bit of backstory, but I'll just go over all of that once we defeat all the bosses, because it will make more sense. And then finally, this girl Penny comes up and gives us some materials as thanks, since she's also helping Cassiopeia. It'll become important later, just trust me. From here, I thought the game would want me to continue on this general path, so I went all the way to Lavincia. On the way there, I found this game's Pikachu clone, and called her just Low Guy, cause she's just a low guy. Now I could've fought the influencer gym leader in Lavincia, but I decided I wanted to do other missions first, so I ignored her for now. I didn't ignore this city's shoe store though, and got probably the best shoes in the game, so my guy was finally looking a little clean. Oh yeah, also this happened, and they just really like each other. And with that, we can make our way to East Province Area 3 for the next Titan fight. The Titan here was Orthworm the Steel Titan, and I had pretty much nothing to counter him. I was also vastly underleveled this fight, so it was actually a pretty tough one. I was able to win though, because of one man only, Joey Wheeler. Joey has the move Breaking Swipe, which was not very effective, but it lowered Orthworm's attack, making it barely able to do any damage after a few of them. It's pretty much the only reason I didn't lose the first part of the Titan fight. Then on the second part, pretty much the same thing. Arvin was kind of useless here, even as a meat shield since his Pokemon died so early. But my mons are awesome, so we were able to clutch the victory. My just a low guy also got her evolution here to just a slightly bigger guy, which was pretty great, especially since she became electric fighting now. After that, we got the next herb, giving Coridon the ability to jump higher. We also learned why Arvin is doing this, and it's to save his poor little puppy, who unfortunately is gravely injured, so much that even Poke Centers don't help. Not gonna lie, this part got me a bit emotional since Arvin's dog is so cute, so I was really happy to take this path, even if he sucks as a support. Next, since it's around the same area, I tried going to the Poison Team Starbase, whose leader is named Atticus, and he destroyed me. Not only was I underleveled, but my team also wasn't very well equipped to fight a Poison Team. At the time, I thought the bases scaled their levels with how many badges you had, and I just needed to grind more. But I quickly figured out that nope, there's actually a set path that you probably should take, but the game doesn't tell you. I was trying to make a circle like this, but instead we're supposed to go more like this. And I learned this as soon as I made my way to the Cortando Gym for the Bug Badge. Our gym test starts out with a really weird section where we roll an olive through an obstacle course, so that was a thing. And then for the fight, Katie's highest level Pokemon was 15. So bye bye to that. And then, not only were my gyms out of order, so were my titan battles, since I went over to Bombardier, and this was just an embarrassing fight for him. I guess that's what happens when you try to fight Mr. Krabs though. And through this titan fight, we gained the ability to swim with Coridon. Following this overleveled part of the game, I also made my way to Team Star's Dark Crew, who had a max level of 20. So yeah, you already know what happened to them. But at the very least, we're now done with the easy guys, so we can go back to playing a little bit more strategically. Before that though, here's where I decided it was time to get a fire Pokemon, and I had my heart set on Charcadet. I then wasted around 30 minutes looking for him, before finally giving up. See, this game has a problem where the map will tell you there's a certain Pokemon close to you, and then they just won't be there. Eventually, this made me so sad that I tried jumping right into our next Titan battle against the Great Tusk. And hey look, we're back to being underleveled. I thought for sure Reese's 2 would have destroyed this guy, but my entire team got annihilated with ease. Guess we're gonna go to the water gym instead. Now to start, when we make it to the gym, our test is to deliver the wallet that its leader, Kofu, left when he was going to the market in a different town. Personally, I think we should have taken a bit of money for our services, but we're a nice guy in this game, so I crossed an entire desert to help this dude. And then, when I finally got there, the apprentice got mad at us for trying to bother Kofu, so we had to battle him first. Felt so good to wipe the smug look off this guy's face. After delivering the wallet, as the final part of our test, Kofu wanted us to participate in an auction for him, which I've played plenty of Zelda Wind Waker, so I know how to make him fold. Now finally, after all that, we can fight this dude. Well, after another quick fight from Nimona. I'm not mentioning these by the way since they aren't too important yet, but we need to fight her every couple of gyms, and hey, thanks for the free money, I'll take it. Then, finally on Kofu, 
I had both Reese's 2 and just the low guy, so it wasn't hard at all with our super effective attacks, and yeah, that's our next badge. And with that badge done, I decided it was time to go back to Lavincia, where we'd fight the influencer Iona's gym. And by the way, I don't know how many subscribers she has on YouTube, but we definitely need more than her, so hit subscribe if you're enjoying the video. Anyways, Iona only agrees to fight us if we make her livestream viral, and her brilliant idea to do this was making us play Where's Waldo with director Clavel. Yeah, I don't know how well that would actually work. Now onto the fight, Iona specializes in electric Pokemon, and we're overleveled yet again for her. I kinda just switched my Pokemon whenever one got low, and beat the fight pretty easily, so that's another one for YouTubers against TikTokers, because thinking about it, she's definitely a TikToker. And with all this training done, we're at the perfect level to go back and fight the poison base. Now my team is still pretty bad to fight poison types, but I recently picked up an Espathra back when I was trying to return Kofu's wallet, so while it was a pretty temporary Pokemon for us, she very much would be able to help. But even with super effective moves, this fight sucks. Almost all of Atticus's Pokemon have moves with the potential to poison our Pokemon, so I ended up needing to use a lot of sacrifices within the fight to freely antidote up. The strategy in general was to throw my regular guys in at first like Joey Wheeler and just a low guy, trying to get the intro Pokemon out of the way. Then finally, on the car, we're able to finish it out pretty easy with Espathra, and that's 3 out of 5 bases down. After this, I decided to explore some more around the map and get some level ups before the next fight. Because of this, Derp evolved into a monkey which was pretty cool, and I found our next party member, Mustache the Dondozo. Immediately I fell in love with Mustache's design, even if he was at level 52. If you have a Pokemon too high level, not only are they harder to catch, but they also won't listen to you before you get enough badges. But I loved this man so much and really needed a tanky Mon, so I got him anyways. Which, as you'll see later, was my best decision in the entire game. After that, it was time for the normal type gym. I was a bit underleveled for it, but I had my fighting type just a low guy, so it wouldn't be too bad, right? The test started us out with having to battle some other trainers to learn hints on a secret dish we needed to order. Then, once we had the hints, we had to decipher them, order that exact dish, and cause a bunch of people to die as the floor of the restaurant turns from a dining area to a battlefield. Now we're on to the Larry fight, who was very much not happy to be here, but that's also not my problem. Anyways, remember when I said I had just a low guy, so I wasn't too worried about this fight? Well, that was wrong. He wasn't fast enough, tanky enough, or strong enough to take out even the first Mon, so that was pretty sad. But through the power of teamwork and an overleveled mustache who lets me use revives when he was out, I still eventually won the fight. But yeah, I really need to stop skipping the overworld trainer battles. So, I actually trained before our next gym fight, and got Reese's 2 to finally evolve for the last time, which also gave me the move Flower Trick. And this move is completely broken. Not only does it never miss, but it always lands a critical hit, which is just insane. I knew Sprigatito was the right choice. I also found my next little bundle of joy, Kevin the Citadel, giving us another tanky mon and one that's ice type. Unfortunately, I replaced just a low guy because I was kind of still mad at her for not killing a single mon in the normal type gym, which maybe wasn't her fault, but whatever, she's out, Kevin's in. Then after that, we made our way to the ghost gym, which for some reason is in this area. They start us out with the gym test of hyping up the crowd, and gravestones by doing some intro double battles against random people. With both Flower Trick and Mustache to tank damage, these might have been the easiest fights of my life. After that, we have the gym fight with Rhyme, which is a pretty cool one. Again, it's going to be a double battle, and as the crowd reacts to your moves, both R and Rhyme's Pokemon get stat increases. I really like this mechanic, especially how I was able to use it better than Rhyme, resulting in our sixth gym badge. Now at this point, we kind of speed ran through the next few bosses. Great Tusk was super easy now that we had Reese's 2 high leveled enough, so much that Arvin didn't even have a chance to show how bad he is at fighting, and that gave Coridon the ability to glide. After that we had the Psychic Gym, with one of the worst gym tests in the game where we did this weird… exercise? I don't know, it was just really boring. And for the battle, unfortunately Derp couldn't last a single hit, so my plan of using dark moves wasn't having the best time, but I won by switching out a lot and using some cheesy strats. Thank you, Mustache, I really love you. Next, we had the Ice Gyms Challenge, and it somehow made up for how bad the Psychic Gym was, because I mean, we got to sled on Coridon. How great is that? 
I also evolved Kevin right before the actual fight with an Ice Stone, and then since I finally had enough badges to control Mustache, he destroyed everyone nice and easy, which means the Elite Four was now open. So yeah, at this point, all that's left for the normal bosses is two Team Star bases and one Titan Pokemon. Our fourth Team Star encounter was the Fairy Base, and at this point, I just went full in on Mustache. He was my highest level Pokemon by a lot, and he's just so good and tanky. I really do love my boy with all my heart. But once Mustache finally got low, I was able to use Reese's 2 to finish the job, even if he barely had to do anything. This was when I realized that most of my team was massively underleveled though, especially since we'd be taking on the Elite Four in a bit, and they're usually around level 60 with all their Pokemon. Thankfully, in this same area at the top of the map, Chanseys can spawn. So my plan was to grind here for their large XP, and I even found a Sylveon who I named Trevor while doing it, which would be perfect for my next few battles. Sorry about that derp, we'll miss you. Finally, once a few of my Pokemon were in the upper 50s, I thought it'd probably be good enough, and it was time to take on our next Titan. This was supposed to be the Dragon Titan, but apparently that was wrong and it's the False Dragon Titan. So yeah, a bit disappointing, but we destroyed them with a few flower tricks, just like you'd expect. So, that's it for the Titans. At this point, Coridon gained the ability to climb mountains, which I wanted for so long, so this was great. Arvin's pup also finally got fully healed, which was really wholesome, and we learned that Professor Sada is Arvin's mom, and she wants us to visit the lighthouse where we met Arvin. But I'm not going there just yet, since I still got one last Team Star base to take out. And to be honest, by the fifth base, something that was really cool at first became kinda just draining, so I was happy these were getting done. There's just only so many times you can fight a car before you get bored. Now this was the fighting type base, and I pretty much just kept throwing my Pokemon out, and eventually whittled them down. Not too much to say about it, which means that's all 5 Team Star members down. Oh, I should probably also mention their story now since it's finishing up. Basically, we learned throughout the game that they only became Team Star since they got bullied at school. The director had no idea this was happening the entire time, and they needed a way to fight back. Eventually though, their leader mysteriously disappeared. This was a person they never met face to face, so they hoped that through continuing Team Star, that person would one day come back. This is when Cassiopeia contacts us, and tells us we have to fight them last because they were the leader all along. Which means it's time to finish our three stories, and have them all come together at the end. By the way, I should mention since I was 14 hours in at this point, I was surprisingly doing really well. I barely showed any signs of fatigue, which is weird for staring at a screen for 14 hours straight, but hey, I'll take it. And now it was time to finish out the three storylines. I started with the Path of the Legends, and once we got into the lighthouse, we were told by Professor Sada that she's currently trapped in the big crater in the middle of the map, called Area Zero, and she needs our help. Arvin was less than thrilled because apparently she's a terrible mom who never spent time with him, but he agreed to go as long as we beat him in a battle first. And I'm not gonna lie, this man finally got his revenge for all the trash talk I gave him. All of his Pokemon were around level 60 now, and I barely knew what any of them did because they all died right away during the Titan fights. So once he made his way to this abomination, it destroyed my team by itself. Yeah, that was pretty sad. But this gave me the motivation to finally buy items for my Pokemon since it was pretty clear I needed them. I got Nevermelt Ice for Kevin, a Muscle Band for Mr. Krabs, a Choice Scarf for Trevor, a Razor Claw for Mustache, a Quick Claw for Reese's 2, and a King's Rock for Joey Wheeler. And with those items, I destroyed Arvin once and for all. Oh, it was also really cute because his final Pokemon was his Mabostiff, so he's finally back to health. I did think it'd be a little funny if we accidentally injured it again, but unfortunately, it was just a regular faint, so that's alright, I guess. After the fight, I was ready to go save his mom, and hopefully finally get to use Coridon in battle, but Arvin said we need at least two more people to go down there, since it was gonna be tough. I recommended Nimona, but he said that she'd only go if I were a champion, but have you ever met this girl? Whatever, man. Guess we need to beat the Elite Four now. At least, after a short questionnaire. Yeah, they quiz you to decide if you deserve to be a champion. I thought it'd be funny to forget what school I went to, and they legitimately kicked me out for getting this one question wrong. Pretty stuck up if you ask me. But after boringly answering the questions correctly, these battles, yeah, they were Elite Four battles. It's still just a bunch of single type trainers, and I had counters for almost all of them. First we had Rika who had ground Pokemon, so Reese's 2 and Mustache destroyed her team easily. Then it was time for Poppy, who for some reason is like 4 years old, so that was pretty weird. She specializes in Steel Pokemon, and since I never got a Fire-type, her guys were a bit hard to hit. 
but I had Mustache, who was an absolute tank for me, and pretty effective at taking out most of her Pokemon, so yeah, second trainer down. Third, we had Larry again for some reason. If you remember, he was the normal type gym leader, but in the Elite Four, he uses Flying Mons. For this battle, I wish I could have solely relied on Kevin, but he died pretty fast since he was my most underleveled Pokemon. So I just continued to switch out with my other Pokemon, and we won after a bit. Then fourth, it was finally time for the Dragon types, which meant Trevor worked perfectly against them. They couldn't do much compared to my fairy type with a choice scarf. So finally, it's time for the champion, Gita. According to her own words, nobody has passed her test in a while because she can't hold back. But I don't really see it to be honest. I mean, this definitely wasn't an easy fight. We constantly traded Pokemon with each other back and forth, but when she finally sent out her ace, Glamora, and went through the effort of terrestrializing it, I was able to one-shot it with a single flower trick. So yeah, I'm a champion now. But before we truly finish the Elite Four path, we need to fight Nimona one last time. This entire game, she really wanted us to become champion for this single moment, since she will finally be able to go all out in a battle. And a bunch of people in the city gathered around since they wanted to see two champions go at it. Now it started out with me dominating like usual, but slowly as we went through the battle, I started to lose more and more Pokemon. She definitely isn't just a champion for show, because she destroyed some of my mons with pretty much no effort. But at the end, it came between her Coquavel and my Reese's too. Our starters facing off one last time. And yeah, I just used an OP flower trick like usual, so we did it! I also really like her character since she wasn't a star loser at all, and was just happy to finally find a person she can battle for real. Which means only one more path to close out before we can finally help Professor Sada. And once we made it to the school entrance, here's where Clive showed up and explained that the whole time he was actually Director Clavel. What? I had no idea. He also claimed to be Cassiopeia, so we need to fight him to take down Team Star. Now he wasn't the worst battler, especially since he used some really annoying strategies like Sleeping Poor Mustache, and that's just rude. He was also able to take out Joey Wheeler, Trevor, and Reese's too. But I woke up Mustache and he came in clutch, so he went down. And then revealed he's not actually Cassiopeia. He was just testing us to see if we had good resolve. Otherwise, he was going to fight them instead. So yeah, this entire thing was kind of a waste of time. But now it's actually time to fight the real Cassiopeia, who turns out to be Penny. Oh my gosh, who could have guessed? And she's really bad. Her gimmick is to only use evolutions, and don't get me wrong, I love them too, but they're a single typing and super easily counterable, so yeah, sorry about that, maybe you should have been stronger. After the battle, Penny's really sad, but Director Clavel reveals that he's going to let Team Star continue, since it was his fault for not noticing the bullying. And their only punishment would be requiring the leaders to continue using their bases as a way to train other people that want to get stronger through them. Yep, pretty happy ending. So now, since Penny feels indebted to us, we have the two other strong trainers we need, and it's finally time to go down to Area Zero. We all meet up and have this cool cinematic where we fly Crydon together. But then we have by far the most boring part of the game. Crydon refuses to come out of his Pokeball once we get down here since he's scared of the place for some reason. So we need to slowly walk through the map while finding four different buildings to turn off their security measures and let Professor Sada free. We also begin to learn that the weird Pokemon around the area are actually Pokemon from the past since Professor Sada has been experimenting with time travel. This is also where Coridon came from. Then once we make it to where she's at, we learn why Coridon has been so scared this whole time. Apparently a second Coridon destroyed ours in a fight for dominance before the game. Kinda sad we got the weak one, not gonna lie. After that, the other Coridon enters the main building and lets out a bunch of prehistoric Pokemon that our friends need to deal with while we go see Professor Sada. And here's where we learn that she's a robot. Apparently the original Professor Sada died because of her experiments, but somehow because of the crystals in this area, an AI was made of her, and that's who's been talking to us for the whole game. Yeah, this whole plot point is really confusing. But now the AI realized that the original Professor Sada was wrong, and we shouldn't mess with time. So she asks us to destroy the time machine. The only catch is, her programming will interfere if we try to do this, so she'll be our true final boss fight. And this, by far, was the hardest fight in the game for me. At first it went just like normal, trading Pokemon back and forth, but once Fluttermane came out, it annihilated my team. I had to use a bunch of revives and thought for sure I was going to lose the fight, but eventually Trevor came in clutch, and I had Mustache take out her final Pokemon, Roaring Moon. Again, he's the GOAT. Then that should be the ending, 
but Professor Sada prepared more countermeasures, like locking all the Pokeballs that don't belong to her and completely taking over the AI. So here's where the AI sent out their Crydon. Luckily, I also happened to have a Pokeball that she owned, so finally, it's time to use our Crydon. And this was the most scripted fight of my life. The other Crydon was destroying us in every way. It had better moves, more health, and in general was just cooler. But once it got us down to 1 HP, our Crydon just barely held on because it didn't want to make us sad and we were able to terrestrialize it. So finally, we used Terra Blast and won the fight, making our Crydon get back to its former glory. Now with all of Professor Sada's measures down, the AI revealed that the only way to take the time machine out was for her to go down with it. She decided to go through the time machine so she could live out Professor Sada's dream of living in the past and told Arvin that Sada did in fact truly love him, finally giving some closure to her boy. So yeah, honestly a pretty good Pokemon story. I liked it a lot and we still have 6 hours till we finish out the challenge so that's awesome, is what I thought. What I didn't realize is these 6 hours would be the hardest of the entire 24 hours. As I mentioned right at the beginning of the video, there was another thing I wanted to do more than completing the story, and that thing was to catch a shiny Pokemon. Now the best way to catch shinies in this game, at least from what we know so far, is to find a Pokemon Outbreak. Then if you defeat 60 Pokemon within the Outbreak, which we could do with the auto battling feature, your chance goes to 1 in 1365, which is much better than the normal 1 in 4096. There are some other things you can do to increase your shiny chance even more, but I didn't have the brain power to do those, so we're just gonna stick with the simple stuff. And for the next 6 hours I went for a shiny Buizel, which may have been my worst decision. I love Buizel, but his shiny form isn't that different from the regular and he's also underwater making him really hard to see. So my brain, which at this point was barely hanging on, had to decipher if there were any shinies. I did take a couple small breaks like testing out the multiplayer with my brother Chris and annihilating him in battle, which did help me a bit since talking to another person is good, but overall this 6 hours was brutal. And worst of all, I never found a shiny. For my entire 24 hours of playing, I did not find one. So. I'm gonna do something dumb. I am now committing to a shiny only playthrough of Pokemon Violet, so see you whenever that's done.